let's prepare for the next talk. Uh, so for the next talk, we have Nicolas Zimmerman. Uh, he's uh, an engineer uh, working on WebKit for a long time. And I'm sure you're excited to hear about all of his great work in SVG. But I think it's important to highlight that Nicolas has been uh, working on the web platform since as early as the 2000. Uh, 2000. Uh, and he started out working on KHTML, uh, which uh, forked to become WebKit, which, as you might know, eventually got forked to become Chromium. Uh, work, uh, another very important fact about him, however, is that he's an astrophysicist, and he specialized in astroparticle physics, so effectively moving from the building blocks of the universe to the building blocks of the web. Uh, who knows which one's more important? Uh, but please, without any further ado, put your hand together for Nicolas. Yeah, hi. Thank you for letting me talk here about the status of the LBSE. So you will hear that acronym more often. That is the layer-based SVG engine. So. Um, it already hints at uh, uh, that we're doing something different because the current SVG engine does not know the concept of layers. And I will talk you a bit about um, what that actually means and why it's problematic for WebKit. But let's uh, first start with a short introduction so that uh, the LBSE work overall has been a joint effort. So between me and my colleague Rob Buys and um, fun fact is that we both actually started together um, this KDOM, KSVG stuff uh, back in 2001. Uh, and now we unified and set again to finally fix the SVG engine that we were like partially responsible for, uh, especially its errors and design issues, which we are going to cover today. Um, so first of all, let me give you a short introduction for those who do not know about LBSE at all. So that's the code name for the new SVG engine in WebKit. Uh, and it started basically as proof of concept in 2019. So it's already a bit a while under development. Um, and the goals that we have with it is, is not necessarily directly new features, better performance or whatever, but we want to fix some architectural issues that have been plaguing WebKit since like at least 15 years. Um, those who have tried to use foreign object and try to do something useful with it in WebKit will have seen its limits. So whenever you put in, a, let's say, an absolute position uh, diff element inside a foreign object, it started to render at the top left of your screen. So it was not like uh, respecting anything related to layers um, in SVG. So that is like the... Um, the most important architectural goal that we want to resolve, getting foreign object support properly working in WebKit, um, that requires a real re-architecture of the whole design. And that is why it has never been done so far, because it's a huge task and you basically, for the first years of doing this, you don't get any reward. Ideally, in the end, everything still works and a few more extra cases work. So it's a, a hell lot of engineering effort, but it needs to be done if we want to enable hardware accelerated compositing, if we want to have hardware accelerated and transform opacity animations within WebKit, if we want to have all the nifty features like 3D transform support, perspective transformations, stuff that's like uh, since a decade available for HTML, CSS, but not for SVG, but it's like the graphic representation of the web which cannot do these kind of things, and that's a pity. And we need to fix that. And for that, um, you need to know that WebKit historically has had two different kind of um, rendering pipelines, one for SVG and one for the rest. And wha where does that come from? So when we started integrating SVG into WebKit, there was no CSS transform module level one spec. There was no transformation support in, in uh, CSS. There was no support for masking. There was only support for basic clipping, no filters, nothing. At that time, SVG was, what we are talking about 2003, 2004, was quite advanced in terms of features. And if you then looked at WebKit, layout was still integer-based, so it had no concept of transformation, nothing. So in order to not break the existing context, to not make HTML slower, which needed none of these features back then, 
it was decided to really decouple these rendering pipelines and do something special for SVG. So whenever you have a SVG subtree that's painted differently than the others. Uh, and that has, um, yeah, that has manifested in the engine and still with us today. Um, so we set up to unify these rendering pipelines um, and have only one sort of bugs, basically. So if you have a bug that affects HTML, CSS, you will likely have it in SVG as well, instead of the situation we have right now where things work nicely in CSS land, you apply the same, let's say, a blur filter or something, a sepia filter to SVG, um, and you start to see bugs, and you wonder where they come from. And that's really because underlying uh, the code paths that are taken are entirely different. Um, so in 2000, October 2021, two October 21, um, the proof of concept patch for LBS that does all of these features uh, was basically ready for the first time. Um, it gave us a performance that was com comparable to the legacy engine. So some subtests, for instance, in Motion Mark were slower, some were much faster. Um, however, all the like new things that you can apply to SVG now, like compositing, support, Z-index, will change. All the things that are unlocked with this were only tested in basic scenarios. And um, overall, motion mark was slightly slower. Uh, two to four percent might not seem worrisome, um, but per the WebKit policy, we never ship any performance regression. So that's completely unacceptable for end users in the end. So we need to get that fixed. But um, I mean, this is only these two to four percent is like representative for motion mark. You find other other cases where it's like 20 times faster, especially on embedded, when you try to animate um, anything with a legacy SVG engine on an embedded device, you will never see 60 FPS. Here you have the possibility if you do it correctly, like not modify the layout, not modify, let's say, X, Y positions of circles, not causing any relayouting, but only sticking to trans um, CSS transform animations, you get it hardware accelerated because nothing is repainted, it's only recomposited. So that's like the key for embedded device performance is to introduce this layer concept for us. So how did we achieve that? Uh, so that is really high level. Um, so SVG needs to participate in this layer tree logic. So if you know about the layer tree um, and how it works in WebKit, so first of all, we have the DOM tree passed from the HTML or SVG source. From that, we build a rendering tree. And that rendering tree is not used for painting. Um, we have another concept in WebKit that's so-called layer tree, and you can think of uh, about it, it's a uh, paint ordered Z-index sorted view of the render tree. So in the end, what you want to paint, you need to traverse the layer tree and not the render tree. That is how it works for HTML, CSS. And there are certain conditions that trigger creation of layers. For instance, you transform an element, you put a filter on it, you put some advanced CSS properties, many of them cause a layer to be transformed, uh, to, to be created. Um, so in HTML, CSS land, also this render tree does not know anything about transformations. But transformations uh, in SVG are like the core of it. Every element can be transformed that's used extensively as opposed in HTML, CSS land. Um, so that was completely different handled in SVG all the time. That led to specific code for clipping, marker, masking, filters. And when this was introduced in CSS, it wasn't like unified or refactored. It was rewritten in a like, uh, different code path for HTML, CSS. It was not easy to unify this. It has never been, so it wasn't done. So now we end up um, that we need really need to be redesign the whole SVG render tree to be convenient with the existing HTML, CSS tree. And of course, we want to reuse as much as code possible from the existing HTML, CSS implementation, which has features like hardware acceleration, compositing, which we do not have in the legacy SVG engine. Um, so the final version of what we came up with in 2021 was a drop-in replacement for the old engine. It was like a 40 megabyte patch that removes all the old engine and puts in a new one, ready. That's not how it works. You cannot get that into WebKit. That was clear to us in the beginning. That's why we are always talking about a proof of concept, demonstrating that we can do something useful with it. So we met um, with the WebKit stakeholders in 2021, 
and thought about how can we possibly integrate this LBSC into WebKit. Um, and what we agreed on is um, we basically need to redo it in a way that it's no longer a drop-in replacement. So that means basically it's nice, you've demoed that what you can do, but we have to really do it again in a way that we can at runtime switch the SVG engines. This was like the hard requirement from Apple's side. And in the end, it makes sense because we, we can always run our tests with the old engine and the new engine in parallel and do comparisons, A-B testing and all of that. So in the end, when we do the switch, if we go that route, we can be sure that we do not regress performance or do not like, regress any uh, uh, feature support. So um, upstreaming of that started in 2021, end of 2021, where we introduced like these compile time flags and additional settings. And from that on, slowly started to integrate our stuff into WebKit. Um, so in not to make this a historic <laughs> exercise, I will now look fast forward a few years and see where we are right now. Um, the, there's a bug report. Uh, I think it's 12 years old. I opened this like in 2020, 2012, that bug report um, with, the with an initial patch to unify these rendering pipelines that was unfortunately not picked up when I uh, left the WebKit world to pursue my PhD. Um, and when I came back in 2019, when I joined Egalia, I, I was like um, very keen on to see what happened in the change in WebKit world, how much is SVG advanced by now. And the answer is uh, zero, nothing. Like all the architectural problems are still there. Nobody has resolved them. So we have to do it. Otherwise, we are not going uh, to see progress on that front. So since then, we have um, worked from, you can see the dates here from 21 to now, uh, upstream something like 160 patches. Some of these patches are like 20, 30 iteration patches, larger patches, so the alone the patch count doesn't say much, but I can assure you uh, all the core functionality that we need in order to support compositing, hardware acceleration, that's all already upstreamed. So um, the last round of progress in LBSE was due to funding from Wix. So if you don't know, do not know Wix, it's a, like a, um, a website builder platform where you can build your website rapidly. And they are using SVG a lot for some kind of effects, logos, text, whatever. Um, and they had a great interest in moving SVG forward, especially in WebKit, since it received much more attention in the other browser vendors. So Google invested a lot in SVG. They did fix many, many bugs that are still present in WebKit. Um, and choose a different route um, to, to achieve um, like a faster SVG implementation. Um, but for us, we made up the plan that we continue this work and try to really integrate the rendering pipelines in such a way that we end up with only one, which Chromium hasn't done. So the status um, back in October 23, uh, when we presented this in a WebKit contributors meeting was um, that LBSE had a lot of functionality related to compositing, hardware acceleration, but it could only render solid filled shapes and stroked, stroked and filled shapes, but no advanced SVG features. There was no clipping, no markers, no masks, no gradients, no patterns, no filters. So everything you expect from SVG was still missing. And that is because there was another architectural issue that we had to resolve, and it's all about the so-called resource invalidation logic. Um, and I will talk a bit about what that is and why it was so important for us to resolve it. So first of all, what is a SVG resource? Uh, that's not a standard term, that's something I dubbed. So SVG has the concept of paint servers. These are these elements, linear gradient, radial gradients, and patterns that you can apply uh, to fill in stroke of shapes and text. And in our jargon, um, we extend the term to all the paint servers plus clippers, masks, markers, and filters, and we call that resource. Um, and I already said that the status of the resource support in October was with no support for anything advanced, only very basic uh, fill and stroke operations. Um, but that we tried to delay this this re this uh, redesign. Um, sorry, the re-implementation of the resources until we finally resolve the design issues that we had in the, in the previous engine. Um, 
to give you an example, um, the resource invalidation, that means reacting to the changes that you apply by script, is fundamentally broken in WebKit SVG land. So if you take that example document here on the left, you can see a simple snippet of a DOM tree. It has a, a clip path, which has a circle inside, has a mask, which has a rect inside, and that mask is applied to a path. But the mask child element, the rectangle itself, is clipped. So we have here a level of indirection. So we have the path object, if you look at the render tree, that uses the mask resource. The mask resource itself uses the clip resource. So you might ask yourself the question, what do we do if we change like, the, the radius of that ellipse? How does WebKit react on it? Um, it doesn't react as you would expect from first principles. It's quite complex. <laughs> so when you, by JavaScript, change that SVG circle element, change its radius to 20, um, by nowadays, all these properties, uh, the x, y, z, x, z, y properties, are, uh, sorry, attributes of SVG, DOM attributes, they are now mapped into CSS properties. That has happened over the past years. So when we change such a thing, what we do is we update the presentational style for that element and trigger a style invalidation. So that's fine from now on. But what happens is when that the renderer, in this case the render SVG ellipse, it does receive a new style, what it will say is I will need a relayout. Because that is, in regular world, if you have a document which has only a rectangle, you change something, you need to relay out. So we're using this very same mechanism here. That means um, when that ellipse is marked for layout, and we would only execute that operation, nothing would change because that ellipse is not visible on the screen. It's a part of the resource. It's only used indirectly. Um, so as next thing, we then say, OK, we need to in find all the users of that Clipper resource and also invalidate them. That's the masker resource. OK, and then the masker resource is used by the path. We also have to uh, invalidate that. And that leads to like a chain of invalidations, and also not synchronously, because when we get a new style, we trigger a relay out, but that's asynchronously. So when we receive, like when we execute that update, after that, we have to Lay, relay out basically that whole document here just to accommodate for that radius change of the circle. And that's totally inefficient. What we actually want to do is we want to change that circle um, and then just repaint the path. That should be sufficient for anything. Layout shouldn't be involved in there. But historically, we made the mistake to reuse the very same mechanism for resource invalidations. And that has led to a numerous bugs of um, uh, security issues in the past, like circles like, that, you, that we didn't break properly, running to endless loops and whatever. Because in SVG, of course, um, you could add a third re resource here that uh, references the first again and create some cycles here. And you need to break them at some point. So um, I left some of the call traces here. If you're curious uh, and want to see on your own how that works, um, I left some hints where you can, you on your own, follow uh, like the, the, uh, the call frames, what actually happens when you try to play that example. I will leave that out here for this discussion and focus um, on that point above. The important one is uh, actually triggering layout from within layout is evil. And we should not and cannot do that because it has led to, in, in the past, also to issues that after layout, the layout was still dirty because there were still some things dirty. So a second layout passed and fixed that, but you had frame delays. So when you ex ex looked at exact frame timings, when, a, when, a, when you expect, OK, there's a new frame that should have the update in, it didn't. The next had it in. So and people that were looking at really at frame by frame noticed these things. And that has been like always in WebKit. And to make things worse, the correctness of the invalidation chains depends on the element order in the DOM. And you can easily create problems when you just move around resources in the document. That shouldn't be possible because totally should not matter where in the document it's placed in SVG. And in principle, you can also place these resources in external documents and reference them. There you open the box of Pandora. I don't want to talk about that at all. <laughs> just the takeaway message is, uh, that's a, a real bug that's plaguing WebKit SVG and kills our invalidation performance. And we need to resolve that. 
status in 2024, it's done. So we finally found an approach to redesign this resource invalidation logic um, that uses similar concepts from S a CSS. And um, it's no longer relying on layout. So we are communicating like these invalidation things differently. And um, all the issues that we had in the past due to that are gone. That's already upstream. And since that was upstreamed, like implementing the rest was a piece of cake since we already had the knowledge how to do like clipping, masking, etc., from the old engine. And we basically just moved uh, like the building blocks we already had into this new concept, married them. And finally, we have all these features available like in like half a year ago, all these uh, looked like unspectacular. Solid build, no clipping, gradients, nothing. And by now we have like all the advanced features. I demoed some of them here, clipping on, on, on uh, text and images on text and uh, on fill and stroke, etc. Uh, sorry, gradients on fill and stroke, patterns, clipping, masking, and recently filters. Um, so, what is still missing, you might wonder? Well, in the short term, like the most important thing for us at present is we need funding for this work. Because over the past four years, we didn't have continuous funding of this project. So while it's of real importance and provides value for the web platform as whole, if you think about Stephanie's talk, um, we don't get any big attention to this. So we are, I was expecting like all the big companies giving us chunks of money to finish this work as quickly as possible so they could realize new devices, making use of SVG like extensively um, because you could have access to something fast to make nice user interfaces on embedded. Um, but really, we do need more partners. So if you have any idea about a funding source for this, please let, let us know. Um, and then, of course, from the um, previous screenshot, what is not upstream yet is the filter support. So um, when we met in uh, October last year, we talked with Apple about these plans and they said, okay, we are going to take care of filters because we have um, one, one guy working on SVG at Apple, one, and that guy is, happens to know the filter, Said from Apple knows the filters implementation very well. So he said he's going to take care of it and he did. So that patch is under review at the moment. Um, and that's really the last missing piece. Then we have we have feature complete in terms of SVG resources, and all these resources that you can see are applicable to all HTML, CSS, uh, all HTML elements and SVG elements. So uh, all mixing is possible. It's running through the same code path. So if you see a bug on an, HT on an HTML element, you have the same bug on the SVG element, and vice versa. So for the web author's perspective, it's much nicer now. If you have a bug, it's universal. <laughs> it's no longer depending on whether I applied it to HTML or CSS uh, or SVG. Um, so that was the second bullet, finish the filter work. Um, we have still some repainting issues related to text and T-span and, and all the related text layout features. That is partially because the, um, the SVG text implementation hasn't been revisited. So we're using in legacy and LBSE the very same code for all of that. So all the performance issues and all the issues we have with uh, the SVG text support and WebKit are still present in LBSE. Um, this, we also have plans to tackle this, but later. So first of all, we need to get LBSE across the finish line so that we can turn it on by default. Um, but of course, to reach that, we are not ready yet because we need to verify, uh, we need to perform a security audit. So once the design is stable, we need to run the whole machinery, fuzzing ASIN, etc., and um, make sure that the new engine is free from uh, use after free bugs and etc. So we need to do this kind of audit. Um, that would be if we had funding like the, the to-do list for the next few months. And then long term is finishing the LBSE implementation. That means all layout path tests have to pass. So out of the, I think, few thousands of SVG tests, we have a few hundred failings still because of individual bugs in LBSE, individual missing features. Some are obscure features not needed often in the wild. Some are quite prominent. SVG as image support, for instance, SVG as background image, as list image and whatever, they have, not, they have still quite some bugs in LBSE, simply 
because we simply haven't started work on that yet. Um, and then most important for us to be able to ship it is we need to ensure that ABS is as fast as the legacy engine in any kind of standard benchmark. At, at the moment, just at the moment, that is uh, quite hard to achieve. In the chosen design, we are, we are creating layers for all SVG elements at present. So not selectively, in, as in WebKit, uh, as in um, HTML land, where we only create layers on, under certain circumstances. For SVG at present, we create layers for everything. So you could think of LBSE as a stress test for the whole layer system in WebKit, because if you look at, let's say, the, the Tiger, uh, the famous SVG Tiger, it creates thousands of layers. Uh, sorry, hundreds of layers, not thousands, um, many of them. And we need to find a design where we can selectively construct layers. Um, to give you an example why that is hard, um, let's assume you're painting three rectangles, three diff elements in HTML, and you paint them in such a way you have a red one covered by a blue one, covered by a yellow one. And you take the middle one and assign a transformation property to it. What happens, it takes that out of flow and it will paint on top. That is something um, because HTML, CSS transformations do not affect layout. In SVG, it's complete opposite. So transformations do affect the layout. That means um, if we would use the same approach as HTML, CSS, and we would encounter in an SVG subtree one transformed element and only promote that to a layer, that would be painted on top. And SVG mandates that the painting order is the DOM order. So in order to maintain that, what we would need as minimum for these kind of constructs are three layers. One layer for the content prior to the transformed element and one for afterwards, so that we can maintain these orders. And these kind of tree transformations for the layer tree uh, have to be implemented in order to reduce the layer overhead. And uh, we have discussed this strategy with Apple, and they are happy with that approach. So we are going to test that as soon as we have bullet one funding for this work. And hopefully, the final task, once we have uh, fixed all the performance issues, is then turning on LBSE by default and getting rid of the legacy engine. Thanks for your attention. Hi. Two questions, if I can remember both of them. Uh, first one. I think I remember seeing uh, paths inside of defs being uh, kind of reusing the same path over and over again um, in multiple places. Does that also become a resource, actually? No. 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 That's just, uh, I mean, you, you mean a uh, uh, path in a def section that's referenced by use elements, for instance? Yeah. No, that's not, a re not, not what we call a resource. No. Yeah, okay. Uh, and then the other, yeah. Uh, in my talk, I, I mentioned the Hummingbird HTML renderer, and, and uh, one of the things they did in their animation system was that uh, because the essentially the spec kind of says when you're doing an uh, animation, you might be calling into JavaScript, um, and that of course creates the whole like you have the layout calls into layout problem. Um, they uh, split the difference by generating a list of things you need to do after you've kind of run this, um, this part of this uh, spec algorithm through. Then you do the list of things which can call into whatever um, and then you keep on continuing. Um, is that something you're also doing to kind of get rid of the layout calling into layout or is that something that could be useful? Mm, that could be useful in, in cases where you really need that. But here it was just basically our laziness that we try to reuse the existing mechanism instead of inventing something new. Because inventing something new for SVG back in 2004 was always seen with caution. Because Nobody needs that. Why do you introduce that? That was at, uh, really where HTML layout was the integer based, and nobody cared for SVG back then. I mean, not in terms of the existing browser windows. They they tried to get SVG support, but with minimal impact, basically. Yeah. Who's next? So I don't know if you saw the recent 
uh, state of HTML survey, um, but SVG was you know among the things that developers cared a lot about and felt like needed a lot of work. And uh, I guess I'm just wondering, like, do you have any insights into why it's so difficult <laughs> to get anybody to spend on this, like browser vendors, or, or uh, you know? Uh, other other companies so far largely you know to get some even collective group of people to say you know yeah we can see why this is really important for our thousands of businesses <laughs> that use SVG um, yeah. yeah do you have any thoughts that you I have <laughs> I have some thoughts on this um, what got us into that situation is basically WebKit so all the advances in SVG, wh when SVG 2 was under development and there was like a lot of traction around this, um, I mean, Emilia, um, one of them uh, uh, active writers of SVG 2, um, she wrote a book about using, uh, one chapter is 3D transformations in, 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 uh, uh, in SVG, like in 2012. And Firefox had an implementation like in, I guess, 2013 where this was possible. and there was always, Google was always looking at is, is what, what is WebKit doing? And from WebKit, the answer on any SVG topic is we are no, not going to do anything. The, because the problem for Apple was they didn't have the experts on that, SVG. I mean, they could have hired, of course, people to do that. Um, they didn't for some reason. Um, I don't know why. Uh, but the problem is there was like no movement. And if you wanted to think about like, advanced features that always means a hell lot of engineering work before you can do that. And that's exactly the, the issue we have with LBSE. I mean, it, it takes so long because it's a lot of effort for basically no gain. So we are still, the, the, the old engine is still faster at the moment, still does more than our new engine. So it's hard work in ahead before you can start about thinking about good new features. And there are a lot of things in SVG2 that I personally would love to reactivate. But for this, we need to have this finished. That's why I'm always saying we need this funding to finally get this across the finish line. Then we can finally also attract more people because then WebKit's position will no longer be, we won't do that, but at least there may be, instead of direct rejection. More questions? Anyone? Uh, thank you for the talk. and. Uh, improving like um, SVG support and uh, potentially improving SVG support and, and WebKit. But uh, given uh, historical, uh, that historically uh, Chrome, Chromium and WebKit share the same uh, SVG engine, I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate on the, different on the difference uh, on approach that uh, Chromium took in this uh, resolving these issues. Like uh, how is it different? Is it worse or better or do you know, really? Um, I cannot tell you this because I haven't looked into detail since this um, composite after paint system was introduced. Um, because I, I don't know exactly. Um, I, I couldn't. I couldn't give you a correct answer for this. So mm -hmm. I would delight this to to Chromium folks. What they actually changed in the past three, I think three years. I think the first composite after paint patch landed, but I do not know of the impact for SVG. I know that before that date, it was very the same in, in Chromium, basically. But, but do they have uh, hardware accelerated, accelerated uh, SVG Yes, they support? have this with, with this composite after paint, I think. Right, okay. So they did something. Correct me if I'm wrong, Chromium folks, but I think they support it. Okay, I, I was, uh, I was, I'm super curious to, to, to learn what, what they did. Like, was it, was it as big as project as you're working on, or they took some shortcuts? Who knows? No, they used a completely different concept. Right. Uh, I mean, in, in SVG, we, uh, in WebKit, we have to do the, the decision if an element is composited beforehand. Mm -hmm. So by looking at, at various things in, in CSS and some properties, we say, okay, this will need to be composited. And I think the, the crooks of their approach is that they, they record all the painting operations and in the end decide if that should go into different layers. So it's a different concept, for sure also interesting to explore. Uh, but we have now settled for this one. And that's so yeah, uh, architectural <laughs> differences. Yeah, it's an architectural difference. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Next question. Anyone? All right. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you.